two-dimensional arrays, here's the simplified mental model. Picture a two-dimensional array as a Google Sheet. There's a certain number of rows, there's a certain number of columns. Each cell in the Google Sheet has a value, okay? Most of the time, that mental model works really well. Um, next semester, when we come back, we'll be doing a lot more with 2D arrays, and we'll be using 2D arrays um, to apply filters and transformations on images. Images are just a 2D array of colors, okay? Um, so that's a good mental model that usually is sufficient. However, sometimes we do more sophisticated operations on um, a two-dimensional array, and we need to appreciate the fact that in reality, there is no such thing as a two-dimensional array in Java. Java doesn't have the concept of a two-dimensional array. Technically, what we're creating in Java is an array of arrays of something. So we can have an array of arrays of ints. We can have an array, an array, array of arrays of booleans. We can have an array of arrays of turtles. But there's no fundamental like two-dimensional array concept in Java. The syntax for this, and, and we'll do more when we, we do some live coding here in a moment, but just a little bit of syntax so when you see this example, it will make sense. If we want to declare a variable whose type is a two-dimensional array, we just add an extra pair of, of square brackets. So we can think of this as an array of integer arrays, right? Or an array of arrays of integers, if we want to read it that way, okay? That's what this type is. And then when we actually create the new array, we specify in the first pair of square brackets the number of rows, and in the second pair the number of columns. So this would create a 2D array with 12 rows and 50 columns. And all the values would have an initial value of zero. To get a value of a specific element in that two-dimensional array, we again have two pairs of square brackets. The first pair is the row index, and the second pair is the column index. Okay. What I think is helpful, though, is to visualize this with this program here. So this is the Java Visualizer program, and I've typed in some code on the left to create a 2D array, an array of arrays of integers, and that variable is called matrix that refers to it. Um, I'm using an array literal here or an initializer list. Um, and so here are the curly brackets for my array literal. And here is the first element in the array. Here is the second element in the array. And here's the third element in the array. What's different than what we've seen before is that first element isn't just a number. It itself is an array literal that has four values, one, two, three, and four. But I think this gives us some insight seeing it laid out this way. Both it helps the mental model of, oh, I've got three rows and four columns, but it also helps us start to understand how Java actually represents this. So when I step through this, on the right side, we're gonna see the model, thank you. We're gonna see the model of what, um, how Java actually creates this. So the variable matrix, its value is a reference. Okay, just like it was for one-dimensional arrays. That's not new. But so the, the value stored in the variable matrix refers to this array in the computer's memory. This array has three elements with indices 0, 1, and 2. That's familiar so far, but here's the new thing. The value at index 0, the value of that first element, is itself a reference to another array. Okay, so that array has four elements with the values one, two, three, and four. And the value at index one is another reference to yet another array. And the value at index two is another reference to yet another array. This is how Java actually stores a two-dimensional array in the computer's memory. We can't represent something two-dimensional in the computer's memory directly because it's a one-dimensional system. Um, and so this is how Java pulls that off. Normally, a mental model of a Google Sheet is just fine, but sometimes we need to appreciate how it's actually done because this allows us to do some more sophisticated things. For example, this next line of code that we're about to execute creates another one-dimensional array called with a variable new row, 
It has five elements in it, so I'll step over that. Here's the new row variable. Its value is a reference to the sequence of values in the computer's memory, 101 through 105. Once we understand how Java actually handles and models 2D arrays, we can do sophisticated things like replace a row in the 2D array. So when I say matrix sub one equals new row, we start with the variable matrix, we follow the reference, we find the element at index one, and we're gonna replace the value of this element at index one with a reference to the array referred to by new row. So when I step over that, the value at index one is now the reference to this array. We've replaced that middle row with a new row. And in fact, that new row even has more elements than the previous one did. So now the first row has four elements, the middle row has five elements, and the last row has four elements. And that's okay, and sometimes that's useful. Okay, a two-dimensional array by default, if we just say new and, and use the square brackets, will have the same number of columns in every row, but it doesn't have to, either by using an array literal and an initializer list, or by swapping out rows after the fact, we can end up with a 2D array where each row has a different number of columns. And sometimes that's helpful, sometimes that's useful. All right, let's, oh, sorry, one more line of code. Um, the highlighted line of code now actually retrieves a value from the array at row index one, column index three. So here's the variable matrix. We follow the reference. We find the element at index one. That's this reference. We follow it. We find the element at index three. Its value is 104. That's what we should assign to the variable value. If I step over the, sure enough, value has a value of 104. Cool. That worked out as expected. All right, let's, now that we have a, a bit of a mental picture of how this works, um, let's write some code together to actually uh, go through this. We're going to actually create a new class. So click on the new class button. We're going to call this new class metal count. Um, I hope this is a good idea. Rather than just doing an example together where we create like a table with so many rows and so many columns, I thought like let's actually model something a little bit more interesting than a generic table. Um, let's model, let's pretend we're creating a class used for like analysis of Olympic medals for different countries. So each row in our 2D array can be for a different country, and then the first column can be for bronze medals, and then silver medals, and then gold medals. Um, so as just an example of what we could, could model, could do here. Um, let's create a couple of constants for how many countries, that is rows, we're gonna have in our table and how many uh, different types of metals, um, which are the columns that we're gonna have in our table. So we can say private final int, and it's a constant, so we make it all capital. So we're gonna have seven rows, seven countries, and three different types of metals, bronze, silver, gold. Just like with one-dimensional arrays, there are two ways to create a new array. We can either use um, the square brackets and specify the number of rows and columns and have everything be initialized to zero or false or null, um, or we can use an array literal um, or an initializer list. Uh, so let's use the array literal approach in this case. So we can use array literals or often referred to as initializer list, to create 2D arrays. And we can do that by nesting curly brackets. So curly brackets inside of curly brackets. So here's what that would look like. 
Um, we're going to do this as an instance variable. So our instance variable's visibility will be private. Um, we want an integer, well, let me write that. So we want an array of arrays of integers. So I have two pairs here of square brackets. And we're going to name this instance variable counts. And then we'll create our new 2D array. We'll say new int. We'll have two pairs of square brackets. And then we'll have our curly brackets. We could write all of this code on one line. When I'm using an array literal for a 2D array, I like to do it in multiple lines so that visually in the code, it looks like a table and I can see the rows and columns. So here's my pair of curly brackets that will define the array. The first element in this array is itself an array. So this is what I mean by nesting curly brackets. Three different types of metals, <coughs> one bronze, zero silver, one gold. There's the first element in the array, which is the first row in my table. Um, we're gonna have seven rows in total. These, the, the specific values here aren't important. I just made them up. If you wanna have different values, that's okay. So another team with one, one, zero. 0, 1, 1, oops, commas, not semicolons, my mistake. Team that hasn't won any medals yet, but it's early in the games. So there's plenty of time. Cool. So by typing it in this format, I think it helps us um, visualize, oh yeah, this is a table. There are seven rows, there are three columns. Here are the values at every row and every column. If we know what all the values in our 2D array are in advance, this is a great way to initialize it. Um, if we don't know, um, we could do it with uh, like, uh, or if we need to calculate it in some way, we could do it with nested for loops. Um, if we have a lot of data, maybe we're reading it from a file and we do that with nested for loops. Um, yeah. Not unlike what you just did in the, the gerrymandering summative lab. So, all right, let's work on the constructor. Let's have a default constructor. We'll get rid of the template code. Um, we don't actually need to do anything in the constructor because we use the array literal here, but I want to at least capture, well, what if we didn't use an array literal? How would we use, um, how would we specify the number of rows and columns and have every element initialized to zero? So there is an alternate way, alternate way to create a 2D array. Um, the initialization, like the normal use of the new operator in the brackets, with the rows and columns would be followed by nested loops to initialize each element. So we could do it like this. We could say this dot counts equals new int. In the first square bracket, we put the number of rows we want. We could use that constant countries. In the second bracket, we put the number of columns we want. We could use the constant metals. And then we'd have something like four, blah, 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 blah. And then another for loop inside of that to initialize everything. So I wanted this like in our notes together here, but I'm gonna comment it out because I don't want it to actually run and it's not gonna compile. There we go. I wanna make sure we use the values from up here. That's how we would create a new 2D array with the specified numbers of rows and columns and every element initialized to zero. So as I mentioned earlier, there's three algorithms we're gonna focus on today. We're gonna to start with the most fundamental one for a two-dimensional array, which is we want to iterate through every row. And for every row, we want to iterate through every column. We're going to write a method that just prints out every column for every row. Um, but we could do any other sort of operation, right? We could calculate the sum of all the elements in the table um, or do any other type of uh, calculation that we may want. But for now, let's just print one. <clears throat> 
So I'm going to get rid of their template method here. We'll do our own method. And this method will print the entire table. So this method will be public. It doesn't need to return a value, so we'll make the return type void. Print table. Doesn't need to take any parameters. So we want to iterate, we want to use a for loop to iterate through every row. For each row, we need to iterate through every column. So this requires nested for loops. And in fact, this is a lot like the code you wrote on the last exam, um, where you're like, just building out a, a table with a certain number of rows and columns. So let's write a for loop for every row. Personally, I strongly recommend that you use variable names like row and column um, and not variable names like i and j or x and y, especially not x and y. That can be confusing. Um, since we're modeling this as a table with rows and columns, using those variable names is really helpful. So I'm going to say for int row equals zero, start at row index zero. Keep going as long as row is less than countries. That's the number of rows we have. Row plus plus. So that will iterate through every row. To iterate through every column, I need another for loop, my nested for loops. For int, I use col as the abbreviation for column. So column equals zero, column is less than metals. That's the number of columns we have, column plus plus. And then inside that inner for loop, I can do whatever operation we need to do. I could sum all the elements. Um, I could increment everything by three. Um, but in this case, let's just print it out. So system.out.print, not print line, because I want to have multiple things on the same line. The way we reference the value, this dot counts. The inside the first pair goes the row. Inside the second pair of square brackets goes the column. This dot counts sub row sub column. Let's concatenate a tab character in here so it looks nice. That will print out each column for every row. Much like we did in the last unit, if we just left the code like this, we'd end up with everything in one really long row. So when we're done printing all of the columns for a row, we need to go to the next line. So we need to do system.out.println. And maybe in general for a different algorithm, there's another operation we have to do after we analyze all the columns for a given row. It would go in the same place. Right. This code will work. It's good. Um, but it's not considered great um, because there's, there's the potential for errors to appear. Um, so let me explain what I mean. Um, right now I'm using this, this constant countries, which is fine, and the code's going to run. But imagine later I came back and I decided to delete one of these rows from my 2D array, and I didn't go up here and change countries to 6. This would then result in array index out of bounds exception. I don't need to use some constant for how many rows I have because an array knows how many elements is in it. I can just ask the array for its length. So I'm going to put a comment in front of this and say it's good. And then I'm going to copy it and paste it here. And we're going to make it better. So rather than using the countries, let's instead say this.counts. Length. The length of my 2D array, the length of my array of arrays of integers, is the number of rows. So this.counts.length is the number of rows. And that way, um, if I change something in my array literal, this code will continue to work. Let's make the same improvement for the inner loop. So I'm going to also mark this as good. And we're going to make it better by replacing metals with the number of columns. Now this dot counts dot length is the number of rows. That's not the number of columns. If we go back here and look at the Java visualizer, 
the length of the array is the number of rows, I need to follow this reference to get to the array for the first row, its length would be the number of columns. So therefore I need to say this dot counts sub zero dot length. This dot counts sub zero returns a reference to that first array, that first row. Let me get the length of that because the length of that row is the number of columns. That's definitely better. I'm making an assumption the way I wrote this code, which in this case is valid, but it might not always be valid. Um, what an assumption am I making and why might it not always be valid? Like how could this code break in a different situation? Yeah. Yeah, I'm assuming that every row has the same number of elements, that every row has the same number of columns, which in this particular example it does, but it doesn't have to be the case. Like we saw with Java Visualizer, there's no requirement that every row has the same number of columns. So we're gonna comment this better, because it is better, and I'm gonna copy it and paste it in, and we're gonna make it best. The best way to define the, the condition for the inner for loop is not to base it on any specific row, but to base it on whatever row we're currently iterating over. So use the loop variable row to get the length of that row. That's the best approach. This structure here of nested for loops um, you will use over and over and over again, okay? Um, we're certainly gonna use it in this unit. When we come back after break, we're gonna be using it um, as we learn about image filters and transformations because an image is a, is a 2D array of colors. And so we're gonna be writing lots of nested loops just like this. Um, so yeah, this will serve as a really good example going forward. All right, let's look at the next algorithm. So we just wrote a method that iterates through every row and for every row it goes through every columns and that can be useful. Another common thing is to, for a given row, is to operate on every element in that row, to iterate through every column for a given row. In this particular example, that would be like trying to answer the question, for a given country, how many medals have they won? Right? We want to sum the medal count for a given country, which is represented by a row. So let's write a method to do that. So we want to sum the medals for the specified country index. And by country index, like what we're really talking about here is the specified row. And so we're gonna need a parameter. We're gonna need to know what is that country index. And that's the index of the country in the table whose metals to sum. And we're gonna return a value. And that value will be the sum of metals for the a little repetitive for the specified country index. Copy that part. This method will also have a public visibility. It's going to return an integer, which is the sum of metals for just the one country. We'll call this metal method sum metals for country. And it takes one parameter, which is the country index. That is the row index. Sometimes when we start learning about two-dimensional arrays, students assume that everything dealing with a two-dimensional array requires nested for loops. 
and that's that's not not the case. Um, in this particular case, when we want to sum the metals for a country, when we want to sum all the elements in a given row, you've already written that algorithm earlier this week. That's just summing the elements in an array. The only difference here is we have to find the reference to the right array to sum, but the rest of it is the same as you wrote earlier this week. So we still need a local variable sum. We still need a for loop. We don't need nested for loops because we only have to iterate through the elements in one array. In terms of my loop variable here, I still want to be consistent and use the word sum in our row and column. If we're specifying a given row index, that means I need to iterate through and loop through all of the columns in that row. So I'm going to name my loop variable column. I'll initialize it to zero. I'll keep going as long as it is less than this dot counts. And here's where I need to specify the row index, the row, which is country index. And then I can do dot length. Getting this part right is probably the hardest part here, right? We don't want the length of the array counts because that's the number of rows. We need to get a reference to the array at the row index and get the length of that instead, which is the number of columns. Once we've done that, we can simply say this dot sum plus equals this dot counts. What row? Well, the row doesn't change. It's always country index. What column? The column is changing. That's why this is in the for loop. It's column. And then we just return it. So this code is almost identical to what you wrote earlier in the week, except we have to be a little bit more careful to make sure we get the length of the right away. We have to get the number of columns here. And when we index into the array, we have to specify both the row index and the column index. The row index doesn't change. The column index does change. All right, you might be able to anticipate. Oh yeah, sorry, go ahead. To extract a column? Yeah, um, not, it's a little more complicated for a column. So if we want to extract a row, that's pretty easy because that row is an array. But for a column, like, yeah, exactly. Because for this column, each of these elements is part of a different array. Yep. And in fact, the, the third algorithm we're going to write together right now is to iter is for a given column to iterate over every row. So in this model, let's say we want to know how many silver medals have been awarded so far. We would say, okay, we want column index one, and we're going to iterate through every row and sum up all those medals. So let's actually do that. We'll do that right now. So let's write our final method for today. This method will sum the medals for the specified metal index. Um, what I mean by metal index is the specified column. For all countries. We do need a parameter. That will be metal index. That is the index of the metal type. Like zero would be bronze, one would be silver, two would be gold in the table to sum for all countries. And then finally, we're going to return that sum of metals for the specified metal index for all countries. Whew. The visibility of this method will be public as well. 
The return type is going to be int because we do need to return that sum. We'll call it sum metals for type. And the parameter we take is the metal index. That's the index of the column. The implementation of this method is almost exactly the same as the previous one. Except in the previous method, the row was fixed and we iterated through all the columns. In this case, the column is fixed and we need to iterate through all the rows. So we still need our local variable sum, which will initialize to zero, and we'll keep it as a running total. We still need just one single for loop, but now we're iterating over every row for the specified column. So I'm going to say for int row equals zero, while row is less than this dot counts dot length, which is the number of rows, row plus plus. Sum plus equals this dot counts. What row? Well, whatever row index we're at based on the for loop. What column? The column doesn't change. It's always metal index. And let me just say return sum. These three algorithms. The first one where we iterate through every row and for every row we hit every column. The second one where the row is fixed and we iterate through every column in that row. And this third one where the column is fixed and we iterate through every row for the given column. This covers so many possibilities that we do with 2D arrays. Um, there are a few other things we're gonna explore tomorrow, um, but this gives us a, a huge start in terms of an example you can refer to as you work through tomorrow's pair programming activity. I do want to share with you a couple of terms and kind of like a cheat sheet to help with some of this. Um, a resource, it's not a cheat sheet. Um, so the term I want to share with you is called row major. Um, so there's, there's two terms, row major and column major. I want you to be familiar with what they mean and the fact that there are two ways of doing this. But just so you know, we almost always do things row major. And unless otherwise specified, you can assume it's row major. What row major means is that in our first array, our array of arrays, each element in that array refers to another array, which is a row, okay? This is what we mean by row major. Okay. Looking back at our Java visualizer, with row major, that means this means we have three rows, and here's um, the first row, the second, the second row, and the third row, right? Um, so that's row major, almost always what we do. We, wouldn't, we don't have to do it that way. That's just the convention. We could do it column major. We could say that the first element in the array of arrays of ints is a reference to an array that represents a column of data instead. There's nothing wrong with this. It's just not very common. Um, there may be like algorithmic or performance reasons why we would want to do this, um, but we're not gonna do any of those in this class. Um, so I want you just to be aware that there are these terms, row major and column major. Um, and what they look like, kind of like in the computer's memory. Um, but you can always assume what we're doing is row major unless you're otherwise told. So, All right, the final thing I want to share with you before we do a couple of pure instruction questions is this table. This is from a resource, um, an activity we'll do next semester, but I think it's really helpful. The type of the value of an expression can get tricky when we're dealing with multidimensional arrays. So if I have, let's say scores is an array of arrays of integers or a 2D array of integers, that's its type. If I say scores sub five, I'm not getting a specific value in that 2D array. I'm simply getting a reference to the row at index five. Its type is an integer array. This returns an entire array or a reference to an entire array of integers. Only when I specify 
the row index 5 and the column index 12, does this, act, this expression actually um, evaluate to a specific integer value? That is the value at row index 5 and column index 12. So this table I find helpful because it just helps me keep track of Wait, what's when I when I only have one square bracket? What's the type of that versus when I have two? So I hope you find it helpful as well.